Welcome to our lecture online and welcome to the series Viewer Requests. And this is again a problem that one of the viewers gave me and I thought this is really interesting. Let's try it. And so here is the way it reads. A skier slides down a 30 degree slope. When the skier reaches the bottom, it takes the same distance for the skier to stop as the length of the slope the skier came down. What is the coefficient of friction both on the slope and on the flat portion, presuming that they're the same. So that's kind of interesting because there's not a lot of information given. The only thing that we're given is that we have a 30 degree slope. Can we solve this problem? And how should we attack this problem? So first let's draw the situation. So we have a skier that comes down a slope and then there's a flat portion. And the angle of the slope, theta, is equal to 30 degrees. So here's the skier coming down, here's the skis and the ski poles, like that. And assuming that the distance d is the distance the skier comes down, and now on the flat portion we have distance d again. So both of these are the same distance down the slope and the flat portion. And the question is, what is the coefficient of friction equal to? So the way to solve this problem is probably use the energy conservation technique. In other words, the energy initial is equal to the energy final. And then if we write the entire equation, we can write that any work put into the system plus any initial potential energy plus any initial kinetic energy is equal to the final potential energy plus the final kinetic energy, and I should say K here, kinetic energy final plus any energy that was lost. And of course the energy that was lost is going to be the energy due to friction, the work done to overcome friction. So let's think about it. The skier st starts up here where V initial is equal to zero. So if the skier starts from rest, that means there's no initial kinetic energy. Also, we're not putting any work into the system. We're not pushing the skier down the hill, so we don't have any initial work put into the system. And so therefore, the only thing we start with is the initial potential energy. And assuming that the skier starts from a particular height, which of course can be related to the distance, we can say that mgh is the initial energy the skier starts with. Then the skier ends up over here. And at that point, the skier will not be moving at all. So at this point, the skier is not moving. At this point, velocity is equal to zero h is equal to zero, which means at the very end, the skier has no potential energy and no kinetic energy. So, potential energy finally zero, kinetic energy finally zero. So the only thing we have on the right side of the equation is the energy lost. So in this case, it would be energy lost on the hill plus the energy lost on the flat portion. And that's the equation. Of course, we need to add a few more things and convert a few more things. We need to figure out what this is equal to, what that's equal to, and we need to figure out what h is equal to in terms of distance. Of course, we need to convert that to distance. Now, you may say, why do we have positive energy loss? Well, it's because it's on the right side of the equation. If we move to the left side of the equation, we would have to subtract it. But on the right side of the equation, we add it, so that doesn't matter. It should be positive on the right side of the equation. So, energy due to overcoming friction. Let's think about that. So the energy lost is going to be equal to force times distance because the units of course are joules, are units of energy, and it's the work to overcome friction, so it would be the friction force times distance. And what is the friction force? Well, let's think about that one. So I need a different color. Let's use blue here. So let's say that the skier is on the hill so that means we have the weight of the skier, mg. That can then be divided into the parallel and perpendicular portion. I think the dog hurt somebody on the front door. Okay, all right. So here, this angle here is theta. So here we have mg sine theta. And here we have mg cosine theta. So because we have an mg cosine theta, we then have the normal force pushing back. That's the normal force. And the normal force is equal to mg cosine theta. It has the same magnitude. It's obviously opposite in direction, but it has the same magnitude. 
and then the friction force experienced here and let me use a different color for the friction force the friction force which is in the opposite direction force friction is going to be equal to the normal force times mu and the normal force is going to be mg cosine theta times mu so that's the friction force and so the energy lost due to the friction force is going to be friction force times the distance traveled and then we need to do the same for the horizontal portion so again for the horizontal portion we have mg going down we have the normal force in the opposite direction normal force equals mg and then we have the friction force which is in the opposite direction of motion force friction is going to be the normal force times mu which in this case is mg times mu so there's the friction force for the flat portion there's the friction force for the uh, slope and now we're ready oh one more thing we're not ready yet we have to relate h to d so here we have a triangle here we have the angle theta the opposite side is h so we could say that h is equal to the hypotenuse d times the sine of theta so we could replace h by d sine theta and now we have everything in terms of d so let's go ahead and fill in the equation mg times h and h is d sine theta so we have mg d sine theta on the left side equals energy lost on the hill friction force times distance and the friction force is right here so that would be mg cosine of theta times mu times d so that's the energy loss on the hill and then finally energy loss on the flat plus mg mu times d we're supposed to find mu and we are told that the angle is 30 degrees so that's the one thing that's given now we can make things a little bit easier by looking at this equation and realizing that every term has an mg in it the weight so we can count we can go ahead and divide both sides of the equation by mg get rid of the mg and on every term we have a d we don't need to know how big d is we can also get rid of d on every term that means our equation becomes a lot simpler so here we have the sine of theta is equal to the cosine of theta times mu plus mu and since we know the angle theta we can solve that for mu somebody came in the door so that's why we hear the dogs barking all right let's come up here so now what we're going to do is we're going to solve that for mu so we have the sine of theta is equal to mu times the cosine of theta minus one uh, my, uh, plus one not minus one but plus one so we factor out a mu we can then divide both sides by the cosine of theta so we see that the sine of theta divided by the cosine of theta plus one equals mu so therefore mu is equal to the sine of theta divided by one plus the cosine of theta which is equal to and now we can plug in that theta is 30 degrees so the sine of 30 degrees divided by one plus the cosine of 30 degrees so mu is equal to the sine of 30 is 0 0.5 one plus the cosine of 30 is 0 0.866 and now we need a calculator so we take 0.5 divided by 1.866 equals 0.268 so mu equals 0 0.268 and that is the coefficient of friction so that when the skier comes down a 30 degree hill the skier will spend just as far traveling on the horizontal section as the skier did coming down the slope and that is how you do that Okay. Why shouldn't you travel longer in the flat distance further? Okay, so that's, that's an interesting question. So let's say you come down a hill and you gain speed and go faster and faster and faster and we ignore all the wind resistance, all right? Then you get to the bottom of the hill and then of course you're going to slow down. Now, if there is no friction, no friction at all, then you would go on forever because then you wouldn't slow down. So the more friction there is, the less far you're going to go. And at some point, 
the distance you travel slowing down will be exactly the same as the distance traveled here. If the friction is very high, then you would not go, f uh, then you go very small distance compared to the slope. If the friction is zero, you'd go very long distance. At the, some point, the two distances are the same, and that's the friction required to do that. I understand that part, but it doesn't seem like ice would do that, or snow. Well, that's a pretty high coefficient of friction. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's kind of insightful to you, uh, for you. That makes sense. If you're really truly skiing, that's what I meant. Let's just assume that the skier didn't put wax on the skis, no, and that, the, that the, the snow conditions are really, really bad. Yeah, it's snow skiing on sand. <laughs> well, did I say it was snow? If you're skiing, I imply, it doesn't imply you're skiing on snow. It didn't say it was snow. Maybe they have those artificial slopes with the mats, the 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 called the Carpet. the carpets. Yes, maybe it's one of those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty high coefficient of friction for snow. What is the coefficient of snow anyway? It's probably less than 0.1. Okay, there you go. That's not snow. <laughs> that's what I mean. None of that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it doesn't make a lot of. Sense. And you remember coming down those slopes, don't you? Yeah, I didn't come down. I wiped, I wiped out. <laughs> All right. Down my face. <laughs>